What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grind Line Podcast. I'm your host, Greg. This is episode 265. We are literally recording like five minutes after uh, Patrick Kane just ruined the hearts of literally everyone in Chicago <laughs> on Chris Chelios' jersey retirement night. I'm sorry, I'm okay, um, my can. I don't care. That's fucking awesome. Electric. Electric. And we Which talked is- about Patrick Kane last week, but... Good Lord, man. For uh, for a game that they look like pretty much garbage for 54 minutes of. Oh, well, three games, what? three games and four nights is rough. Oh, yeah. Especially after being home for a couple and then having to go right back on the road for today. I mean, yes, it's tried Chicago. It's not that big of a deal, but it's enough on top of the emotion. For those that don't know, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. They did Chelios's retirement tonight in Chicago. So that was partly emotional because you know you played in Detroit for what nine ten seasons won two cups and on top of it you also have Patrick Kane making his return for the first time to, to Chicago since being traded along with Alex Dabrinkit just super high emotion Detroit's been playing at a fantastically high level and for most of this game you wouldn't have thought that that was the case for how they've been playing did Alex Debrinkit not go back to Chicago after being traded to the Senators? I, I I'm that would have been sure. my only guess of of a reason why they wouldn't have also done like a tribute to him is because I feel like he's probably already been back there since being traded. I'm pretty sure he has. I'd have to go back and look to be quite honest. I know that someone did post during because him and Kane started the game on the ice, and it sounds like they both got a pretty good ovation, which. Props to Chicago fans for as much as I hate that team and their fan base in general just because they're Chicago. They showed out in the best way for Patrick Kane today, and it was impressive. Even if it was followed by a huge Detroit sucks chant. It was so perfect, though. It really was. It was so on brand to see. the like That was what makes today's atmosphere with the way they celebrated Chelios and just gave him all the love, retired his number seven. The way they cheered on Kane and then go right into Detroit sucks chant, which obviously Ken and Mick got a huge kick out of it. But that's what's that's the fun of sport right there was how today played out. And then even Kane ripping their hearts out with a beautiful OT winner assisted by none other than Alex Dabrinkit, who had just tied the game six minutes prior to that or whatever. Off an insane shot. Oh, it was the perfect moment to see Peter Morazic let in a goal because you can always expect at least one of those from in a game. Debrinke was what two feet below the goal line, throws it toward the front of the net off the back of Mrazic's leg. And it just trickles in the Dylan Larkin special now. Yeah. But no, it was, I I think the highlight though, like with the Kane situation was just after he scored that game winner, even though they were destroyed and gutted, the fans were there still giving him an ovation. He got to do another. He did a full lap around the ice and it was just it was high octane emotion today. And the fact that Detroit pulled out a win after looking like hot garbage for almost more than two thirds of that game. Amazing. The play wasn't like it, but the I feel like the atmosphere in the arena was that of the Detroit Red Wings Chicago matchups of old when Detroit was in the West. That's mm-hmm. what it sounded like in there. Now, the product on the ice, very much watered down because Chicago has a has a terrible team that doesn't score a lot. Now, they did, they were pretty stifling defensively. They I have think been they, all year for the, I, yeah. mean, I shouldn't say all year, but they have played up to the competition this year. Like, they've shut down McDavid and Ottawa. They were just, they were highlighting what they did to Winnipeg a couple nights ago. Like, they've played for... They shut down not, McDavid in Edmonton. Well, the, uh, Well, yeah, sorry. But you said uh, they, that's weird. Why were they playing McDavid in Ottawa, Ryan? Did I say Ottawa? My bad. See, I, I, I'm so flustered because of that, the way that game played out. But no, they've shut, they've shut down some of the top teams in hockey. But obviously, they just can't figure out ways to win, which for us, that worked out great because they had plenty of opportunities. But Reimer bailed them out more or less the entire game. Yeah, if you want to talk like, about just players in general that really kind of stood out in this game, Reimer played well. Yes. Uh, Reimer needs to work on rebound control. Like someone in the discord said, Reimer is made out of rubber and he needs to stop (laughs) doing that. Um, But Reimer played well enough to keep them into this game in which they were playing like they had just woken up 40 minutes before the game started. 
it, I made the comment earlier. It looked like they uh, were partying too hard for Chelios last night upon their arrival. But uh, I mean, outside of people apparently thinking me saying Reimer puck handling and the team puck handling means Reimer is not playing good in goal. Like he had, like we were just, that is what you want from your backup goaltender. This is what we were talking about before the season where obviously we didn't expect Lyon to take the reins and be the true number one. We thought it'd be a battle between Reimer and Lyon for that backup spot. Now with Huso down again, Lyon has more than solidified himself as your number one. But now going down the stretch, Reimer has just got to do what he's got to, what he's been doing for most of his career, and that's just being good enough. And now he's had back-to-back games of great outings. Love it. Yeah, tonight he had two goals against on 30, uh, 35 shots against. That's 33 saves for a 9-4-3 save percentage. That's all Huge. you could have asked him. He stoned Bedard. Like, Connor Bedard, except for the fluky, uh, not fluky goal, but goal where there was shape. Okay. Let's take a second to talk about Shane Gostas bear in the middle of this. So that power play goal aside, like Shane Gostas bear does a lot of standing around lately doing nothing, which is really starting to a tank his trade value. If you were going to think about trading him and B really, really hurt our defense, which has not been stellar to begin with. So aside from Reimer shutting down Bedard, I think that I don't think that, power play goal would have happened if ghost would have just moved like two feet, like mm-hmm. literally two feet to the front of the net. Because he, when that goal went in Bedard, literally he goes like this, he shrugs and goes, I don't know. And the, I don't know was why didn't the dude play defense? I don't know. It's he, he has been such a roller coaster, even though he's putting the points up on the board and real quick correction, because I obviously had blocked it out. Reimer had a very poor outing against Dallas or I'm sorry, he had, a, he had a decent outing coming in for relief against Dallas, but I think he got pinged with the loss. But he also had a, that great shutout against – or a great performance. I don't know what I, – I can't talk or read stats apparently – against Toronto. But he's only had three appearances in the last month. Four, today was his fourth. So Calgary shutout before that Dallas. He had a relief appearance or whatever you want to call it. And then the Toronto game. He's – won three of his last handful of games, even though they lost that game, he didn't technically get the decision against Dallas. So he's doing what you want right now, I guess you could say, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's game 58 for the Red Wings. So right now the Red Wings sit at 32, 20, and 6, 70 points on the season. We literally had 69 points for about five minutes of uh, overtime. Between the end of the game and the end of overtime, the Red Wings were sitting at a nice 69 points for a few Ew. minutes. Uh, but right now they are in the are still locked up the first wild card position. Uh, they are two games uh, in hand on the Tampa Bay Lightning and one point ahead of them. The Devils now drop to seven points out of playoff position with loss to Tampa. So that's kind of what you needed to see is yeah. the Devils at 62 points, the Caps at 61 points. Uh, and if we go and look at where the Islanders, the Islanders are sitting at 60. So the teams that are underneath that are just missing the wild card are about to drop off. And it looks like the, you might see five teams from the Atlantic, which I think we talked about at the beginning or before the season started that the Atlantic's a strong division and you could see five teams from the East uh, are teams from the Atlantic in the playoffs. Yeah. Like it's, I think we were talking about it last week, but the team to really pay attention to, I don't think we should be, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself, but watch out for the Metro's third seed because Philly holds that right now at 67 points. They've got a five point buffer over the lot. All those teams that you just mentioned, as long as Detroit's pacing with them. And honestly, Tampa is at that same point. They're two points ahead of Philly. We're now three. That's, I think going to be the important one to watch because unless something crazy happens with us, I mean, we're, we got two games in or one game in hand on Toronto, but only four points back. I mean, some crazy stuff could happen there, but Toronto's been on a bender. They're the last 10, they're eight and two, but Detroit's right there with them at seven, two, and one. So we'll see. Yeah, Austin Matthews. You mean the Toronto <laughs> Austin Matthews? That's kind of what they are right now. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi, though, apparently today had a hat trick. He did. And speaking of Matt, I, I love the shade. Were you, did you see PK going off about Toronto yesterday during uh, the segments? No, but I did see, see PK give some love to Dylan Larkin. 
Oh, he did. He gave some love to Larkin, talking about his impact and how he is a 1C in the National Hockey League. That's so crazy to think about, you know? Like a guy that's a point-per-game player, playing on your top line, going in the, the most difficult matchups. It's like some guys just can't get the respect that they deserve, as we've talked about really the last couple of seasons. I don't know. It's crazy. Maybe bias. I don't. But, you know, when you got people like P.K. Subban, who was for the longest time one of the best defensemen in hockey and played against a guy like Dylan Larkin, you know, they might know a thing or two. Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Uh, but like, so the Red Wings, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, three games in uh, four nights and Ooh. they take all of them. Uh, the there's not really much to talk about for the St. Louis game because it was an absolute clinic. I I had at one time said did St. Louis remember how to play hockey. Uh, they no. chased another goalie in Jordan Binnington. He was out. Uh, they brought in their backup, still got two more goals on him. They win that game six to one. But the game I kind of want to talk a little bit more about uh, is the the game against the Colorado Avalanche that felt like a playoff game. And Mickey Redmond even said, if they win that game, they're going to the playoffs. In the third period, especially. Ken, Ken refrained from saying that exact line right there. He let, he teed it up for Mick each time and made sure that he said it because he didn't. I don't think he wanted to fall victim. Doesn't to want to jinx future. it. Yeah. <laughs> I think, though, that that was the kind of game where you look at the Colorado Avalanche and they're a contender. Like, they're a serious contender. Well, yeah. And you were able to shut down McKinnon for the most part. You were able to shut down Rantanen. You went into that game in Makar. In Makar, and you stole that game. That's what you did. You were able to go in and shut them down and, and come out with a win in a game where you were not favored at all. And you win that game two to one in OT. And it's on it another felt, Kane winner. Yeah, it just it felt different. So when you 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 look at the games this season and you're like, yeah, I feel like they're they're doing something. They're progressing forward. They're getting points. They've got a lot of offense, a lot of depth scoring. And then you go into a game like this and you worry because defense is where you've lacked. That's been the problem most of the season. And to be able to only give one goal to the Colorado Avalanche and to come out of that game where the defense plays a pretty solid effort all night and you just have to rely on getting a couple goals, one goal, and then an overtime winner. It's just that that was the game where you say, okay, this is a team that, yeah, they'll make the playoff. And they're going to probably hurt whoever they get in the first round is not going to be happy with them. But it's just that that felt like a, a game that's like they're in, right? Yeah. I hope so. Because, I mean, at home, Detroit has been, for lack of better words, extremely impressive. Now we can go back like a week or so ago and look at that Edmonton game, look at that Vancouver game, and be like, maybe we should slow down a little bit. But they also have beaten Vancouver. Edmonton, I don't think they beat them at their other. No, they lost the other matchup at home this year. But the fact is, they're still playing great, good to great hockey against the top teams, whether it's the West or the East. Today, obviously not a great game, but what did they do? They figured out a way to not only get the point and go to overtime, which, like we said, they did not look good tonight. And it just took a random puck on net, Nolan, the Nolan Bianchi special, and tie game. Now you got five minutes. Can you make something else happen? Nope. Okay, we'll go to overtime. Now we got a point. You're back. You stayed in that number one wild card spot by getting that point because of the game situation with Tampa. So winning these types of games and going back to the Colorado one, like that was another emotional day because it was the uh, was it the final Heritage Night game that they had, Hockey Town Heritage, where they were honoring McCarty. Yeah, that was Darren McCarty night. Yeah. So they had that to start the game out. Whether or not that played an impact, who knows? I mean, it's still something that's going to be at the forefront because you go back shit 30 years almost and that was the epitome of hockey right in colorado and you talk about beating good teams too i mean like i said we beat the avalanche we beat the seattle kraken who have been a good team we beat the in canucks. seattle yeah we beat the canucks once we beat the golden knights we beat uh who else we beat, we beat the panthers we beat the maple leaves 
Yep. We beat the Kings, who were still a good team at the time that we beat them. Rain Edmonton the distance, and you've beaten Boston. You've beaten the the list goes on. Winnipeg, they struggled in. That was a rough game on the road. They're they're, sh- they're doing things. You know, it, a lot of us, I think, would have thought it's like kind of slowed down or stopped happening because tonight gave them their fifth one in a row. You're beating teams that you that you should, should. Beat, like Chicago, but then Calgary. you're also beating teams that you really don't have much of a business beating. And that's where you make up those points to get into the playoffs. Um, so it's I mean, it's been a really impressive run these past five, six, actually like seven games. It's been an impressive run. Well, in the month of February. They're not including tonight. So including tonight, Detroit is six and two uh, on the on in the month of February. Like I think we said last week that if they would have had, if they would have even picked up four of their games in December and won those games, I mean you're looking at a much different picture right now. You're oh, in, you're in third. Yeah, you're in third easily, and it's how many games did you say if they picked up picked up four? four? They just picked up four in December. Four games in December puts them at 78 points. Yeah, they'd be sitting four points ahead of Toronto and two points back at Florida. And I think that would have been totally possible if not for the David Perron suspension, the goaltending injuries. Yeah, uh, there's a lot that went into that. They had but a lot of injuries that hit them around that time. They did. But would you say that the team that you've seen in the past five games and the team you saw at the beginning of the season, that is who this team is? It's not a fluke. That's just who this team is now. That's they've, they've found their identity. They've hit their stride. They know what they can do. They know who they are. That's, that's what they are. Is this the new Red? I, I want to say, yeah, because this is what's been preached about. This is like, you've got a team, like a team is hitting the ice. It's taking everyone. There's not like you look at some teams and to call out in Edmonton, for instance, they got their top six, which can obviously play with anyone. But you roll through all four lines, you're like, man, it's not bad. But they're still a dangerous, scary, dominant team. And they have also actually, the, the offensive output is just unreal. But I think with the way that this roster is built out, and we've seen it because Sprong, he scored again tonight. What, how many goals does he have now for the season? Uh, that was Sprong's 16th goal of the year, correct? I believe. Hockey reference won't update till tomorrow, so that's what's throwing me off on their stat lines right now. When you've got a guy in your fourth line that's got 16 goals, you've got 12 guys at 10 goals or more. I mean, they, I love the highlight they're talking about, and this just increased again tonight. Coming into the Chicago game this evening, Detroit's had 75 goals on the year from players that weren't with them last year. So not only is it because of some of your top players with Debrinket, who now has, what, 22 goals? And then Kane just got himself up to 12 goals already in 26 games. Which I wouldn't be surprised to see an extension come within the next week for Patrick Kane. Yeah, I mean, we did see the rumor out there, and Emily Kaplan, she wrote about it a couple of days ago, and then she reiterated it because I think she was at the Rangers game yesterday. Uh, Rangers and Devils, right? Who was gone? Uh, but she mentioned that Perron apparently was on the trade block, which in a way surprised me. It did. Uh, let me rephrase it. It, do, it does surprise me, but didn't surprise me. We are about to steal my segment to uh, segment two thunder here, Ryan. All right. I won't jump too far ahead. Then I'll give you that one. But the way the way that Detroit's scoring at all at, on all four lines. And you've heard the players even talking about this lately. It's huge. Because that's not what we've seen the last several years. No, that's the buy-in. It's been like you've had a top line for the way this team has been built. With I shouldn't say it's been built, but the way that things ended up ultimately played out. They've had a top line and a decent second line, and that was it. Everyone else was just there making money. Yeah, well, they're they're wasting money. Um, well, but I'm gonna end. We'll end segment one this way. If you look at Money Puck right now, and I'm not sure they updated with the last game, the Detroit Red Wings has a, have a 65.1% chance of making the playoffs with, I believe, the second easiest strength of schedule in the East going into, it was a couple games ago, they had that uh, list. Now let's look at uh, Tankathon real quick while you're saying that. Right now, the, the teams around them, so the Tampa Bay Lightning, it says, have a 78.3% chance of making the playoffs. 
Toronto Maple Leafs a 99.3% chance. But if you look at the teams that are chasing them, uh, Jersey has fallen to a 20.8%. The Islanders are at a 6%. The Flyers are at a 718 So they basically got the Flyers locking up that third spot. And the Red Wings, pretty much Red Wings and Lightning locking up the wild card positions based on Money Puck. Uh, which is is has been pretty decently spot on with their projections for the playoffs. Yeah, it's crazy that the Islanders, man, they they fired their coach Lane Lambert, which I know a lot of Wings fans were kind of clamoring for. But uh, yeah, that's that's a confusing team because you've got one of the top goalies in hockey with Sorokin, who's making four million this year, and they sign him to a long term extension where he jumps up to 8.25 million starting next season. So they've got some things to cut, try and figure out because a lot of their guys aren't going anywhere. They've got some big contracts on the books. And uh, that's an interesting situation over there. The Islanders, they thought that Patrick Wall was going to come in and be their savior. And I think they need more than a new coach to save that. Wait, did he pull the goalie the other night with 10 minutes to go? When they were down, Dude, like he is three. known. He is known for pulling the goalie. Not normally that extreme, oh, I but know. I've seen him pull it with like six minutes left. Yeah, that's I. I can kind of understand that. We that's a thing. Five six. You've minutes seen when feds down in the KHL. Three. Fedorov has pulled the goalie with like seven minutes or nine minutes or something crazy. He's done it in overtime. That's nuts to me. That's I really know. bad. But they've also won because they basically turned into a four on three power play and eat it up but that's still too much risk for me still way too much risk. <laughs> no what we're gonna do uh before we get to the sec- second segment we're gonna talk about some trade rumors coming up um we're gonna take a quick break Forward. we're gonna take a word from DraftKings, and then we're gonna have some cool news i think on the grind line merch front uh but stay tuned uh we'll be back after a word from DraftKings. We know hockey games move fast, but with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can bet 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. And right now, we might be taking the Red Wings to lock up that second wildcard position in the East. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code THPN. New customers bet just 5 bucks on the NHL and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-878-9777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. And we're back. And as Ryan had alluded to earlier before we went to break, Emily Kaplan had written an article. I love Emily Kaplan. She is fantastic. She's probably one of the most underappreciated ESPN reporters out there. But she put out a great article. You were going to say something nice about her. No, I was going to say right? she's come a long way, especially if just like the way she's come from reporting and really since ESPN took things over with TNT, she has improved a lot and she's actually very enjoyable to watch and um, during game broadcasts and the sort. So it's been to your point, she's been great. So she wrote an article for ESPN that basically was talking about Derek Lalone saying what a gut punch it was at the same time that, that they're at this year, last season when they traded off a bunch of people, they traded Tyler Bertuzzi, Philip Pronick, Oscar Sundquist, Uh, Jacob Vrana. And then she says she was surprised a few weeks ago when she heard that David Perron, a pending UFA and an emotional leader in the locker room, was potentially on the move, which we had talked about, even with Daniela, that if they were going to do something, it's probably move a guy like Perron to get him a chance at winning a cup. Even though the Wings may make the playoffs, they're not really a Stanley Cup built team, but they could move Perron because he's getting up there in age and he give him a chance to win another cup. But she goes on to say, I do think there were legitimate discussions about trading Prawn, but they have since quieted. In fact, I believe a contract extension for Prawn could be in play either right before or after the March 8th deadline. And I read that and I'm like, oh, that's good. They're not going to trade Prawn. Like they're going to hang on to him. And then when I read about an extension, I kind of paused. And I paused not because I'm like, I hate David Prawn. Why would you do that? 
David Perron is, like we've said over and over, one of the best puck protectors in the league. His offense has dried up quite a bit. But the problem, my my main issue was that if you're going to try and move in guys like Carter Mazur, if you're going to try, and I mean, Carter Mazur is probably your one forward who you want to move in as a winger. Your other guys are centers. Your Marco Casper is a center. Your Nate Danielson's a center. But if you want to try to move a guy like that in, you need a spot. And Ron, even though you love him, even though he's a great veteran presence in the room, I think bringing in Patrick Kane also replaces some of that veteran presence. And if you say you're going to extend him, and, and I would absolutely hope you try and extend Patrick Kane, I think that you can move on from a David Prawn if that's what you're worried about. And you can move in a guy like Mazer and get some youth, some grit. And he even showed today when the Grand Rapids Griffins broke the Milwaukee Admirals 19 game win streak that Carter Mazer has a huge offensive upside as well as just pissing people off. So you could slot him in that same spot. You would actually improve your team. Now what you lose is that locker room presence. But I think you get that with the other guys that are already here. That's a tough one because since the turn of the year, he's got 14 points in 20 games played. Like he is fitting a role, a very specific role on this team, and it's working. Do you have how many of those points are secondary assists? So still on the short, it's still on the score sheet. I mean, he had a big assist in the the win against um, Colorado the other day. So he's like, he's impacting the team. In ways that you would hope so. I mean, sure, he's only got uh, hockey reference. Be nice to me. Not including tonight over his last five games. Two points. And going do you back not to think the Carter Mazur could do that, though? But then you go to Edmonton, he had a goal and assist and that crazy shoot out of a. Or wait, no, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, he had a goal and assist there. So four points over his last six games, not including tonight, which I don't think he actually hit the score sheet, but. No, I, I I think that he could. Like, I know that we've gone on record saying that a guy that we could see walk and not be upset about it would be a prawn. I mean, we, we know the impact that he makes off the ice. That it, it goes without question. And he also shows that on the ice, because like you mentioned the way he's one of the probably better puck protectors and or battle guys they've got on this team. But you bring in a guy like Mazer to your point, and that's huge. That's going to, and not only because of it's the same type of player, but now you're also getting a guy that can skate much better. Not saying that Perron's a poor skater. He's using his age and his wisdom to his, adva- his advantage and making things happen the way that he needs to. But you're going to, because what's his contract at right now? Uh, David Perron, one year, 4.75 million. I mean, if he takes half of that, do you do it? If or is it even more than half? If he takes a quarter of that, and then maybe you let a guy like Christian Fisher walk, I'm just thinking of, of space. Because looking at your UFAs at forward, you've got Perron, you've got Kane, you've got Sprong and Fisher. I would want to keep Daniel Sprong. I would want to keep yep. Patrick Kane. Those are the two UFAs that I go into next season saying these guys especially for a team who's hopefully going to make the playoffs that next season you want to make a push. Those are two guys that will help you get there and move further. See, and I think to that point too, where you mentioned Sprong, you could almost flip their contracts. You give Sprong, he's shown that he can score goals and especially with limited time on the ice. Now, do you look at potentially upping his role? Because if you you kind of look at the way those two go at it, they're similar in the way that they battle for a puck. Because Sprong is able to make things happen in the corners, force pucks out. But you look at the way that he can skate and impact the game even more in that sense. And fire the puck on net while falling and scoring a goal. That was beautiful. That was pretty tonight. It even caught me off guard. But honestly, yeah, you give Sprong maybe a two-year deal at 475 and bring Perron back on a one-year deal at 175 or 2 mil. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't make it work. And I mean, you could even go as far as to say, I don't know, trade Robbie Fabry. Like that's you could make another move either by the deadline or the off season where you could make room for someone like a Carter Mazur. I'm just saying that re-signing David Perron, unless he comes in super cheap, unless you say like, 
David, we we're going to give you vet minimum or whatever to play another year. I just, I'm not sure if it's a hundred percent necessary. Yeah. I mean, cause you can tell how much he enjoys being here. And oh, I, I absolutely. Like, like when you go back to the, the interview with him and Trev, like he has settled in and he is absolutely loving being here. And you've already seen that from Kane. Like this is becoming for lack of better words, a destination. And we've seen that really since Iserman took over because the, the, the main quotes have been when Steve, Steve Iserman's calling you, you listen. And that is still true in a lot of the, the things that are happening. So maybe because of where he's at in his career, Perron does, like you said, I don't think he's going to take the vet minimum. But I guess if you look at that and maybe he, the, you bring him down to the $2 million mark, I'd be okay with it because fun facts, you get 2.625 million back from your Jake Verona buyout or retained salary, excuse me, not the buyout. Boom. That's taken care of. Not even an issue. Nothing happens. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's just more of a, for me, it's more of a roster spot that I think you could free up to move someone in. And I think to your point of when Iserman calls, you listen. There's another guy that apparently Iserman has called that is not listening. So David Pagnota had tweeted out that uh, he he does his kind of write-ups every week. And uh, he says, the Detroit Red Wings explore the market and look to adding, adding non-rental pieces to their roster. A young forward, Jonathan Berggren, remains an asset they are dangling as bait. Having an outstanding year in the AHL with 38 points in 37 games. And performed well in a brief sting with the big club. It says sting, but I think he meant stint. Uh, But word is he recently rejected a contract extension pitched by the Red Wings and wants a shot at a full-time NHL gig, something he clearly isn't getting right now in Detroit. Around five teams, including Calgary and Montreal, have expressed interest. There was another Pagnota article that basically says we suspect the Detroit Red Wings are looking for a forward, but don't be surprised to see them try to pick up a defenseman with bite. The Wings may have a lot of blue liners, but they don't have anyone that is hard to play against. And if you're looking at Ottawa, who who is hard to play against there that you're trying to get? And maybe Chikrin, I'm not sure he's very aggressive. No. But the Berggren rumor to me, and it's floated earlier this season, and we talked about it earlier this season, I could see him being mad. I mean, he's killing, he's, he's obviously far too good for the AHL. I mean, he's like a two point so far in the past few games. I've, I've checked in on grand Rapids. He's getting like two points a game. It's yeah. crazy what he's doing over there. And, and we had said that, yeah, it's the defense that he needs to work on. And who does he beat defensively? Because Perron's your guy that he's going to tr- kind of beat out in the forwards. If you're trying to move him into a top six role, you just resign Michael Rasmussen. I mean, you're, you're not moving Kane for him. You're not moving to bring it for him. You're just trying to fill in that other top six piece. Robbie Fabry would be a guy that you could argue, but yeah, because he's could been be up one. and down. I guess does that does it saying that he rejected an offer is that like a lock then that Jonathan Berggren's done as a Red Wing? No, I, if if it's long term, then that makes the most sense because who knows if it was a two way deal? I doubt it. But he's he's got arbitration rights going into this off season. So he can try to demand that he is worth more than what they're saying. And it's not the end all be all because we've seen it kind of go both ways with arbitration guys with Eisenman, where if you usually go to ARB, you're pretty much on your way out the door. But I don't think it's been as a hostile situation as others. Like maybe you could look at a Burt or you could look at uh, who's the other one that was big. Anthony uh, you? Yes. Where those guys ended up not on this team anymore. I don't think it's going to be that situation. But if you do bring back a Perron, like that would be a perfect opportunity to have a Berggren slot in and not only give you top nine minutes, because I don't, I'm not upset if he's not in the top six. He's shown that he can be impactful in any role that he's out there on. But you're not only, because with Perron, he's on the power play. Berggren now has to slot in somewhere because now you get a, le- a right-hand shot one-timer versus Berge's left, left-hand shot. And you've already got some dominant guys on the, left, on the right side with, their le- with the one-timer on the- over there, but then you also have 
trying to think of how the power play is set up. But you got Raymond sometimes slotting in on the right hand side. So that's taken away a one timer opportunity. You've usually got your defenseman at the point, and sometimes they'll go down to the slot. But right now that's Ghost and or Cider. So there's you, you want Fergie to be free to make an impact on there. And I absolutely believe that he could. But it's the way the roster said, it's just it, I, I struggle with it. And, but I also said kind of this, and we all did the same thing with Kane. Where does he fit in? And obviously yep. it's anywhere because he's destroying things right now. Now you want to flip it? Ready? No, but yes. Send Berggren to Pittsburgh in a package for Jake Gensel. Oh, I saw that one the other day. I would do that in a heartbeat, and I don't care how you have to make it work. So Pittsburgh is going to need some young guys. That's a perfect, perfect young offensive guy to bring over there to Pittsburgh along with a pick and probably another prospect uh-huh. to get Jake Gensel, who's on an expiring contract. Yep. Which and is dangerous, but it, it's dangerous. And you would only do it if you could get an extension in place for him. He's to be 30 years old. He's coming off of injury. Uh-huh. And Jake Gensel's a guy that you're having a hard time solidifying your top six. And he absolutely does that. Your top line at that point is Larkin Gensel Raymond, basically. Your second, unless you want to keep Kane with Larkin because Kane's been good with Larkin. But as you see tonight, Kane's been good with Dabrinkit because he always is. I don't think your top line right now, unless something crazy happens or you need a big body like what they do with Rasmussen a couple of games ago, that top line is pretty much solidified. So now we're looking at line two, which would be Gensel, Raymond. Comfer. Comfer. Yep. That's That's got a little bit of snarl to it because Gensel's a tough nosed player. Raymond's shown, I think since Raymond took that hit against Vancouver, he's almost been a completely different guy. He has been throwing the body around like tonight. And they highlighted this on the, uh, on a replay. Raymond had a nice little dangle that brought him into the center of the ice and he had a good shot on net for a scoring chance. But Felino, the type of player that he is aggressive, hard nose, going to throw the body. He caught Raymond pretty good, but Raymond, Almost looked like he was ready for it off the hit. So he's been playing with a bit more of an edge, if you will. Snarl, Ryan. Snarl. We'll go with that. But he's also more aware of what's going on around him. So he's not getting caught in that situation. But he's been just pretty much a freaking dick out there. Just throwing the body, getting into little scrums around the net, driving the net hard with or without the puck. and. Now you add a Gensel like that, because Comfort, he, he can float, meaning he can find the open space, but then find those guys back door or what have you in the slot to make a play happen. So I think if you did something like that, I, would, I wouldn't be again. So right now, Jake Gensel, like I said, he's on the last year of his contract making $6 million. He is due for a raise. He's also on uh, LTIR. He, yeah, and 50 games played this season, 22 goals, 30 assists for 52 points. Last season in 78, played 36 goals and 37 assists for 73 points. Season before that, 40 goals. In 2018-19, he had 40 goals. So he's two-time 40-goal scorer. Uh, if he played the whole season in 2022-23, he probably would have also had 40 goals. So he's another guy that, aside from solidifying your top six, adds more offense. So I'm not really sure if you need He's just not good defensively. So if you look at the J fresh war cards for Jake Gensel, 98 offense, uh, but sitting at a zero defense with a projected war of 75 uh, finishing of 47, but he's got really good goal numbers, really good assist uh, numbers. He's got great competition numbers plays with Sidney Crosby. So, I mean, that's, you, you get the Sidney Crosby bump a little bit and people will say that's, that's not as effective right now. I would beg to differ because Sidney Crosby still proves that he is one of the best players on the planet on a nightly basis. And I I just think they'll remove Jake Gensel from Crosby, but put him with, put him with JT Comfer and Lucas Raymond. Lucas Raymond is more than shown that he is absolutely a hundred percent capable. Like we were just talking about running in scoring goals, being hard on the puck, uh, making slick passes, I think he almost had that 30-second Gustav uh, Nyquist possession for goal a few nights ago, and where he just circles the goal and and runs around and scores. But I think that he's a guy, instead of having to flex Perron up into your top six or having to flex Michael Rasmussen up into your top six or 
Uh, Joe Valeno at one point, they played it as a top six winger. You bring in someone like that, and even though he's 29 and he'll be 30 before next season starts, and he's probably going to need a decent raise into the seven and a half, eight million dollar range. Is it a move you? Is it a move you make if you can move money out? I, I think so because, as we've seen with contracts so far with Eiserman, you, you wouldn't think it's going to be much more than three to four years. And for a forward like Gensel, yes, he struggled this season a bit with with injury, and but he has played full seasons. And it's not to say that that's something that we're we should be worried about, but what I think is most important here is that he puts up points on the power play. And if you want to really maintain what you're doing with this team, outside of just adding a top six skilled winger, which their now, special teams has been phenomenal. I know. Now you're only adding to this, whether it's on your top line or your your second line. And to be honest, some of the way things have played out of late. Their second unit, quote unquote, on paper, has been outperforming their top power play unit. Now, is he going to play defense? No, probably not. But we've also seen Alex DeBrinket and guys that you wouldn't expect to be coming back on a back check to break up a three on two or odd man rush situation showing out. And that speaks to the system. With Sidney Crosby, do you have to play defense? I guess that's the no, question. Not really. So how much defense is he just foregoing because he knows the other guys on his line will keep up for it? Is, is he just told, hey, go out and score goals? That's what we want you to do. Go finish. Well, yeah, because that's where you think about, like, to your point of having a Raymond and Larkin as his line mates. And then you've got your second line of Comfer, Cat, and Kane. Like, that would be huge because really you can get the same. It's not the same level of intensity on defense with Comfer as it is with Larkin. Because Larkin, you could arguably consider, isn't at the same level, but similar style of defensive play as what a Crosby brings. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that they are the same type of person because Crosby is still forever near the top of what he can do defensively as a forward and center. But that springs your wing wingers into a breakaway or an odd man rust situation when you've got a fast moving centerman that can make things happen and disrupt plays and then set your guys up for success. Yeah. So you've got options there. You could, like you said, you'd have a top line of Kane to bring it Larkin and a second line of Comfort Gensel Raymond, or you could switch the top line up. You could go Gensel Larkin Raymond on a top line. You could go Kane to bring it Comfort on a second line. It solidifies your top six, like a hundred percent. That's a player you get and you say, we want to be Stanley cup contenders in three seasons. And you bring in a guy like Gensel, you, you have your top six down and you, for all intents and purposes, also have your bottom six down. while trying to move some guys in because you're, you've shown that throughout your lineup, you've got guys that can score. You've got guys that can defend your fourth line has been one of your better lines on a nightly basis for like the yeah. past 10 games. They did it again today. So bringing in a guy like Gensel, these are the kind of moves that you make to say we're ready. And the other thing, too, is like we're speaking in the what if of bringing Kane back on a, on a short term deal, maybe two to three years. This is even if you didn't bring Kane back and Jake Gensel goes to free agency. Like that would be a replacement style player to look at as well on the wing. It's obviously not the same, whatever, I get it. But though he's the type of high-impact player you're going to need as you continue to try to grow and wait for some of your, your younger players to truly hit their stride and be impactful for this roster. Yeah, I think it's, any way you look at it, the Red Wings are in a great situation. And you, you mentioned Kane, re-signing Kane is what a lot of this hinges on. And I, I think for Kane, it's, it's a no brainer. And we had talked about it a little bit, like have, have the Red Wings done enough for Patrick Kane to resign here. And I think what we missed in all of that is that Patrick Kane is like, and Tyler might've touched on a little bit. He's really happy here. Like he's, he's close enough to home. He's playing with a team that is really has a ton of heart. And I think that's, what's getting them through this is that they're, they're playing They've stopped playing for themselves and they've started playing for each other. 
And that's a big thing. And that's what these guys and people keep saying, you don't need all these vets in the locker room. What are you doing? Signing these over the hill guys. That's what they're for. The yeah. David Perrons are to come into this locker room and saying, you guys need to play for each other. Same with Patrick Kane. He, he's older. He knows what he's, he knows what it takes to win cups. How they beat the Red Wings. Like that's, that's a thing that not a lot of teams can say they've gone the distance like that in a high pressure situation. And you bring in guys like, like same with JT Comfer. They know what it takes to get there. Yeah. They know what the team needs to do to take that next step. And it's not just go out there and score a million goals, but it's the play for the guy next to you. Yeah. And even I, I wish I had the quote from post game. I caught it right before we jumped on, but Kane and really cat over the last couple of games have spoken to what this team is doing for one another and how they're going to bat. Like you're not relying on and the discord just had a comment comment that Larkin has been kind of hold of late, which I have to go back and look at his, his game logs, but they're not relying on one person to go out and do it all. Like we've seen over the last several years. That is a huge weight that's been essentially lifted off of Larkin's shoulders because more often than not, it was, Hey, you need to go do something so we can maybe kind of look alive to try to close this game out and win or try to make it eventful. That's not the case anymore. Like you said, fourth line fire sprung scoring goals is 16th of the year. And that what's his, what's his average time on ice right now? It is. Oh, Daniel Sprong, 12 minutes and 42 seconds average time on ice, and he has 36 points. I mean, come on. But they're doing it in all different ways, whether it's scoring goals. And now I, I, what I really appreciate is that really since the turn of the new year, and we've talked about how Newsy highlighted they needed practices. They needed to be together as a team to try to finally relax and get comfortable with one another. And we've seen that defensive shift, especially from the forward group of getting back in plays, breaking up scoring opportunities, odd man rushes, or just trying to get into a lane and just drop a shot or a pass coming across the ice. There's still the frustrations, but you can't expect the perfection all the time, which we are fans. So we try to go that route with it, but it is what it is. But you, you can just tell the way that things have shifted. And now here we are sitting with 70 points just behind Toronto by four points for the four, the, three, the three spot in the, in the division. And we're looking really good in terms of other teams making their playoff push. Now it's only going to get harder. There's what, 24 games left? It's going to suck from here on out. It's going to be the most stressful shit we've had to deal with in a long time. But that's going to awesome. be the most the, the best stressful shit we've had to yes. deal with in a long time. Yes, because at this time last year is where things went. But I like doing these hopeful podcasts, right? These happy, hopeful podcasts, because for, for those who have just started listening to us or are pretty recent, we started doing this when really the whole thing went to shit. That's when we started doing <laughs> Not the saying podcast. it might be our fault, but you never know. No, no, no. It went to shit. And then we started the podcast. Tyler started the podcast with a couple other people brought me on. Then we brought Ryan on and now it's just us three. And it, it's been, yeah, well, mostly just us two. And then <laughs> Tyler likes the guest spot every now and then. Uh, but, there's the dig on Tyler. We hadn't hit it yet. <laughs> but we were to the point where it, it's, we don't know really how to approach a lot of it because we still are kind of apprehensive with getting too excited. Because we don't we've know been what to do hurt. with our hands. We've been hurt so much as a podcast where we've had to do just negative episode after negative episode and talk about the failings of Ken Holland and why. I yelled we at have... a lot for that too. Like, quit being so negative. Like, they well, suck. What do you What want? are we supposed to do? Like, like we can't do, ep you wanted us to do episodes at that time on how nice their, sh their skates relay stuff. Like, come on. Yeah. Justin Applicator got an assist or something. Like, what oh, are we, what are we doing we... here? But it's nice to be able to turn it around and just do happy episodes. And before we close out, I just want to give a huge shout out to Alex Lyon, who still with 27 games played has a 268 goals against and a 916 save percentage tied for, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six in the NHL uh, with Jonathan Quick and Sergei Bobrovsky for a 916 save percentage right now, Aiden Hill with 23 games played has a two, two, seven and a nine, two, seven, which is insane to me. It's and he absolutely time insane. Too. He was hurt, but it's, it's just a big kind of, that's their guy. 
Alex Lyon has become their guy. A lot of nights they are playing for him. They are playing better because of him. And he is keeping them in games that sometimes they have absolutely no business being kept in. So I think my MVP so far this season, if I had to, I love picking the goalie for MVP. And right now, up to this point, Alex Lyon is making a really strong push for MVP in my book. Yeah, which is crazy because I know we've referenced it before, but when you look at last season, when we did our midseason MVP, it was Billy Huso. And I think Larkin was a close second, and then things just kind of fell apart from that point. So the fact that we can probably pretty safely hang our hat on your goaltender being your MVP right now, especially because of what he's helping them do, is huge. And, but you look back, in a way, it's almost not surprising. It, it, it is a little bit mainly because of how we were so uncertain what to expect when the season started. And we didn't even see him until freaking Sweden as it is. But he led Florida, and we've mentioned this before, he helped lead them to the playoffs last season. Now, yeah, Bob took over once they got going uh, in the playoffs, but he was a big part of their success. And now he's doing it again. So it's not like it's a, a crazy fluke to see the Lions doing it. It's the fact that he's doing it again. I think, which is is important, and especially for the fact that he signed to a cheap deal for the remainder of this year and into next season. And so you've got him and Huso locked in for next year. If Huso can't stay healthy, we'll, we'll it'll get addressed. We'll see what happens. But you've got your goal. Aging Sebastian Cosa. It could be Cosa because he had, if I'm not mistaken, another huge night for saves. Yeah, 40 save night, I believe. Whew. Yeah, and they won again. Yep, they did four no. to two against the Milwaukee Admirals. Amazing. So, so I think that uh, I think that's gonna do it, right? You want to do final? Th- let's do final thoughts. Oof. Make them quick. Yeah, I, I'm still hyped. I mean, I was. I think Thursday night's game. So, final thoughts for me is the way this team is playing. It's it's different. It's something that we haven't seen in a very long time, and to be along for the ride right now is awesome, because we talked about it before the season that as we progress through, as long as we're talking about them being in position for a wild card, it's a win. Whether or not they make it, it, it is what it is. But you wanted them, you want us to be having this conversation a little over a month and a half from now, or a little less than a month and a half from now, because that means they're playoff bound. You don't want to see a fall off. There's there going to be some losses you have to lose. Just don't have it where it's three, four, five games in a row because at this point you can't afford that. So as long as they just keep bringing the depth, being sound defensively, huge. Yeah, I, I, the high from Thursday night's win, I think, was the most I've had all season. Tonight was fun. Coming back, being down, winning that game against Colorado in overtime and the way that they did it. Oh, to put it this way, I was down in the basement watching the game. Chelsea said she heard me yelling from all the way upstairs, two stories above. Amazing. So that's that tells you how good that one felt, especially because of going back to the 90s and that rivalry. It's never going to go away from for me, and I love it. Now, before but, you got on, I left the room to go do something, my office to go do something, and my wife goes, what did you yell yes for? And she had turned off the game and turned on Grey's Anatomy. And I'm like, you just missed one of the most electric overtimes I've seen in a long time. As, as soon as um, Kane went on that breakaway, I stood up and then I let out a huge ass yell. And the fact that I didn't wake because we're on, I was in the living room. The fact that I didn't wake either of the kids up, absolutely incredible. But no, oh, man, that, like that, that, that's what's been the most fun, I think, so far this year. And I'll try to wrap this up, but. The wins have been fun, a lot of fun. Not saying that they haven't been like that the last couple of years, but it's this is taking it to a whole new level because now they're in the conversations. You've seen that percentage go up when you're talking about money puck for the potential odds of getting into the playoffs, and that's amazing. So I'm just going to keep enjoying this as we can. We're coming down to, what, two weeks away from uh, the deadline. so. Maybe we'll see some extensions. I, I'm hesitant to say there's going to be some trades, but you never know with Stevie, so we'll see. Oh, yeah, already Ryan 33. Yeah, uh, keep on a lookout for some fun stuff 
uh, fun stuff with us and Vintage Detroit here pretty soon. We're going to be doing some fun stuff with Vintage Detroit. That's all I'm going to say now until I sign the contracts. But we're going to be doing some fun stuff with Vintage Detroit. So keep an eye out. Uh, you can follow me online, bring the wing. You can follow the Grindline Podcast online at Grindline Pod. Again, Vintage Detroit, the only place you should get Detroit jerseys from and worked on a massive, uh, we have sold a massive amount of jerseys for Vintage Detroit just by reminding people that they are on their last batch of Adidas jerseys. Adidas has sent them all they're going to get. So if you are looking for an Adidas jersey before Fanatics takes it over and ruins absolutely everything, go to VintageDetroit.com. They, it's, I think it might be VintageDetroitCollection.com, but they ship all over the United States. I believe they also ship, do they ship to Canada? I know they don't ship to Australia. No, they'll, they'll ship out. I'm pretty sure they go to Canada. I think they will do international shipping if you actually reach out to them and negotiate a little bit. Um, I think they'll get it figured out for you. But uh, it is just VintageDetroit.com. Yeah, so go to VintageDetroit.com, get your jerseys before they run out, and then you're really, really sad when Fanatics ruins everything next season. I would like to give a shout-out to the Hockey Podcast Network for hosting us and spreading us around at HockeyPodNet on Twitter. And uh, yeah, it's uh, go sub to us on YouTube, like our videos, subscribe to our channel. You'll get notified whenever new stuff goes out. I am off to Vegas for a week, so you will probably see less tweeting from the account. I'm not dead. I'm just in the hell desert that is Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> but that Sounds will unpleasant. do it for us tonight. So for Ryan, I am Greg. You stay classy. I keep